let me just take a brief moment to introduce the great give before I take you into the deep worlds of MDS and splicing. But this is a 36 hour um, time period to donate online to fantastic nonprofits in the greater New Haven area. My favorite um, nonprofits are Music Haven and Connecticut School of Survival. We need everything in New Haven. Um, but um, I won't know if you give to anybody else. Just be generous, give, or give at least $25 so um, we support our community. All right, so I'll be telling you about mutations in SRSF2 um, and how they affect RNA splicing. So just a brief primer on MDS. Um, Myelodysplastic syndromes are a disorder of the hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells and are characterized by ineffective hematopoiesis, cytopenias with anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia, dysfunctional mature cells, dysplasia, hence the name, and abnormal cell maturation. And by definition, the blasts have to be less than 20% in the bone marrow. And these pictures just give you a little idea of the dysplastic changes that we find in the bone marrow and peripheral blood. So MDS is characterized by recurrent genetic abnormalities. Um, we have for a very long time known about the chromosomal abnormalities, so loss of chromosomes 5, 5q, 7, and 20q, gain of chromosomes, so trisomy 8. And then in the genomic era, we have actually have a learned a lot more about these diseases. So there are mutations in DNA methylation pathways, in chromatin modifiers, in transcription factors, DNA repair control genes, in the cohesin complex, and of interest to our lab in particular, in RNA splicing. So the um, splices of mutations at MDS were published by the Ogawa group in end of 2011 and have since really um, transformed some of the sessions at um, hematologic and especially MDS meetings. And what you can see here is that the mutations actually affect genes or proteins within the key um, splicing machinery, so key splicing factors. And um, they are very frequent. They occur in about 50% of patients with MDS. Um, their allele frequency is high, so 40 to 50%, which suggests that they, they occur in the dominant clone. And what you can see here is that they're actually mutually exclusive. So every vertical line is a patient, and then every horizontal um, block is a specific gene mutation. And what you can see that there are only very few patients who have more than one splicing factor mutation. Um, what does that mean? Well, we'll find out, but they either, um, either no patient or no cell can tolerate mutations in two genes, or maybe they do the same thing, and it's exciting research that's ongoing right now. The other thing we know that um, just one mutation um, does not make MDS, so they occur with other known mutations. From all this, so we can take that they're driver mutations, and we should definitely understand the pathways um, they affect and how they function. So my laboratory is particularly interested in the splicing factor SRSF2 or serine arginine-rich splicing factor 2. SRSF2 is mutated in about 20% of MDS and about 40% of CMML. Um, SRSF2 has two domains. It has a, sorry, an RNA recognition um, or RNA binding domain and a serine arginine-rich domain. And what you um, can see here is that the mutations actually occur in only one amino acid, so in proline 95 that's mutated to histidine, leucine, or arginine. Um, SRSF2 binds so-called exonic splicing enhancers, so it binds to specific exons, then interacts <coughs> with other factors of the spliceosome and thereby affects either exon inclusion or exclusion. It also possibly recruits PTFB to PAL2 and thereby affects transcription elongation. So what I'm showing you here is that um, this mutation actually occurs in the C-terminal end of the RNA binding domain. Here you see the structure of the SRSF2 RNA binding domain in the free state and when bound to RNA. What you can see is that this canonical RNA binding domain in the free state and in the bound state forms this very organized structure that doesn't have a lot of freedom. But you can see that the N-terminus and um, C-terminus in the free state, they can take all sorts of configurations. So they're not very, in the free state, they're not very defined in their position. Um, the little star here is supposed to indicate where roughly you know, the mutation is located. What you can see now in the bound state, so in um, yellow and red is the RNA, you can see that now the um, N and C terminus actually take a very organized configuration 
And you can sort of guess here that um, they both may interact with the RNA. So for a clinician, we probably took an unusual approach, but um, um, turns out, I think, a great approach, and you can judge at the end of the talk. Um, we first really wanted to know whether this mutation could actually affect RNA binding, so we used the minogen splicing assay. Then we collaborated with fantastic colleagues in um, the biophysics departments and performed isothermal calorimetry and nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And then la lastly, we um, pursued in, um, in vivo RNA binding and um, RNA sequencing techniques to identify alternative altered binding in vivo. In this mini gene splicing assay, Wood took advantage of the fact that SRSF2 regulates its own expression. And it does so by binding an alternative exon that is then included in the transcript, but thereby creates a premature <coughs> stop codon. And thereby, this transcript is actually slated for non sense mediated decay, and the protein levels um, are tightly regulated that way. In the mini gene splicing assay, this alternative exon is included in this uh, mini gene um, that has um, beta globin exon 1 and 2. And um, what you can see here, this is the SS2 specific isoform, and this is a beta globin specific isoform. And we, in the same cell or in the same cells, can detect both isoforms by a simple PCR assay. Um, I have a little hard time seeing this here, but um, so in the first line is just the cell was um, transfected with this mini gene plasmid, and you can see that we have a predominance of this lower isoform. When we then knock down the endogenous esters of two, you can see that we seem to have even more of this um, endogenous isoform. When we now overexpress wild type esters of two, you can see the shift where now this exon specifically is included. And what you can see here quantitated that if we overexpress at the same levels, the mutant. Um, SRS2, we actually have increased inclusion of this isoform. And that would suggest that SRS2, the mutant SRS2 binds more to this alternative exon than the wild type SRS2 protein. Um, prior work by um, the, the Allo lab in Switzerland identified a binding code for the RNA binding domain. And um, the binding domain actually binds a consensus sequence called SSNG. The S stands for C or G, the N stands for any nucleotide, and then the G has to be a G. And we are um, very sophisticated techniques. They figured out that the wild type RNA binding domain actually binds the sequence CCAG and GGAG with equal affinities. So now we wanted to know whether we actually um, would see any um, change in the binding affinity in our mutant um, SRSF2 RNA binding domain. And so we performed isothermal calorimetry. Um, it's a um, complicated technique, but um, let me simplify it here. So you pretty much have a chamber that's um, insulated. You have a reference cell, and then you have your sample cell. You, have, you put defined amounts of protein into the cell. That's the RNA binding domain, so SR2 RNA binding domain. And then in, you inject very defined amounts of this RNA um, um, RNA sequence and then measure um, heat release and thereby we can determine the binding constant or dissociation constant. So first we verified that indeed the wild type RNA SRS2 binding domain binds CCAG and GGAG equally well. So here the KD is the same. And to our surprise or um, delight, um, when we used any of the mu mutant RNA binding domains, we actually found that the affinity for the CCAG sequence it's mu is much higher, about fourfold higher than um, for the wild type or for the GGAG sequence. And then interestingly, when we permutated the sequence further, again, the wild type binding domain binds GCAG and CGAG equally well. But again, the second C here seems to determine a higher binding affinity for the mutant isoforms. If you mutate the RNA binding domain just to an alanine, you can see that we don't see any of these um, trends. To confirm this data and also to understand how this um, mutation actually would alter the structure of the RNA binding domain in collaboration with um, Gary Daubner and Frédéric Allain, we performed um, our NMR modeling. So they had previously solved the NMR structure of the RNA binding domain. And what you see here is pretty much, it's kind of a subtraction of um, 
wild type versus mutant on a binding domain bound to the, to the CCAG um, RNA. And every dot represents an amino acid. And what you can see is that the core binding domain um, doesn't really show many changes <coughs> when in wild type or mutant. But you can see here by the numbers that the um, C and N termini, termini show the greatest shifts. And confirming our difference in binding to CC versus GGAG, you can now see when we do the same for the GGAG RNA, comparing wild type versus mutant binding domain, you can see that now these shifts no longer occur. And when we kind of look, when we look deeper into the structure of the RNA binding domain bound to RNA, you can now see that when we have the CCAG sequence bound to the to the protein, you can see the proximity of the proline to the second C in the sequence, whereas if we have GG and G bound, you can see that the proline seems to be at a greater distance to the second um, nucleotide in this four <coughs> nucleotide sequence. So in summary, I have just shown you that um, the SRS of two P95 mutations affect the C-terminal arm of the RNA binding domain, that the mutations skew RNA consensus binding from CC and G to um, GC, CG, and GG, and G in vitro, and that this results in altered structure of the RNA binding domain when bound to RNA. So next we wanted to know whether this had any implication for RNA binding or splicing in vivo. So for that purpose, we performed a very interesting technique called hits clip, hits clip, so high throughput um, um, cross-linking RNA binding Im immunoprecipitation. And what that allows us to do is to um, either pull out RNA tags bound by wild type or by mutant SRSF2. In conjunction with RNA sequencing, we can then tell, well, does this also lead to altered transcripts in the cell? And then you know, future assays will involve proteomics where we can actually detect abnormal protein or decreased protein expression in these cells. Hits clip relies on UV cross-linking of the SOS of 2 RNA complex in vivo, radioactive labeling of the bound um, RNA tag. Um, we then load the um, SOS2 RNA, radioactive RNA complex on a protein gel and then visualize this complex, not by a Western blot with antibodies against the protein, but actually by the P32 labeled RNA. We can elute the RNA. Um, reverse transcribe it, um, amplify it, and then um, sequence it. In brief, that it looks like this. So we generated an inducible lentiviral vector that has either wild type or mutant SRSF2 uh, with a flag tag. We can um, actually somewhat titrate the expression with, depending on how much doxycycline we add to the cells. Um, we can then identify now this, this shift of the SRSF2 bound to RNA in our protein gel. We can isolate this RNA, reverse transcribe it, cut out um, you know, these smears here, and then submit those to sequencing. We were delighted to see that, um, that our hit slips reads actually um, have a very high or highest percentage of protein coding um, Transcript, and that's relevant because in you know, most of the RNA in the cell is actually ribosomal, and we didn't do any other permutation to get rid of that. We really only pulled out the protein um, bound to RNA. And we were also delighted to see that we actually had a difference in binding between wild type and mutant SRSF2. And to confirm our in vitro um, by physical data, we th actually then also were able to show that mutant SRSF2 has predominant binding to CC and G and GC enrich uh, motifs in, um, in the RNA transcripts versus wild type, where, um, which has higher, um, compared to mutant, higher affinity for G C, G and G and G, G and G. So this data actually confirms our in vitro and structural biology work. Um, so then based on our hits clip data and our RNA-seq data, we are able to generate a list of overlap genes so that are both differentially bound and differentially spliced in our RNA-seq data. And this may be hard to see, but um, this is again a PCR looking at a white type isoform and a, sorry, skipped um, isoform. And um, these are our cell lines either um, wild type or induced with doxycycline to overexpress wild type SRSF2 or mutant SRSF2. And you may be able to see very, very faint band here, which is evidence of the skipped um, isoform, skipped exon isoform 
If we then um, look at these same um, genes in um, primary cells, so these are wild type C34 cells, this is an AML that is wild type for SSF2 and an AML that's mutant for SSF2, you can now see that our hits clip data actually um, predicts um, alternative splice events that occur in primary patients. Um, <coughs> At an at a, at a Evans Foundation meeting, that um, so the foundation um, really in the most wonderful way funding MDS research and fostering co like collaborations, we presented our data and Omar Abdel Wahab was also there. And at the same time that we were doing our assays, he actually made an inducible mutant um, mouse and um, performed RNA sequencing on di um, different cell populations, so stem cell populations and progenitor populations and um, was able to show that um, in mutant cells, GG and G um, containing exons were predominantly repressed, so excluded, and CC and G um, rich exons were predominantly included, so really um, showing that the, the, the binding difference that we found in our assays are relevant in vivo. And this is shown here where you know, CC and G rich exons are included in the primary mouse cells, and GGNG um, rich exons are predominantly excluded. And what is particularly nice, since we always ask, well, is, does it make sense to study this? Is this um, mutation relevant to MDS? Um, the mutant um, knock in mice actually have a decreased white cell count. They're mildly anemic. And um, the anemia is actually, it's macrocytic. The mice have dysplasia. Um, the cells actually have a decreased competitive advantage in preferred blood but there is an increased competitive advantage at the LSK and um, MP levels. So this is really what we see in MDS, where we have some clonal advantage in the bone marrow, but then those cells are unable to contribute um, normal blood cells to the preferred blood. So second summary, um, so SRS2 mutations result in altered RNA binding and alternative splicing in vivo. They result in inclusion of CCNG or GCNG consensus rich and exclusion of CGNG or GGNG consensus, consensus rich alternative exons. And these mutations replicate MDS in vivo in mice. So, where are we taking this? We're taking this further. Um, we're now interested in looking at alternative splicing events in primary C34 um, stem and progenitor cells. We are working with um, Omar to determine alternative splice events in myeloid. Um, lineage um, malignancies, so c particularly <coughs> CMML. Um, we're interested in well, what um, downstream targets, what genes actually cause the MDS phenotype. And then, of course, the question always is um, when you're a clinician in the cancer center and Dr. Huxter introduces you, well, will this ever lead to clinical trials? So, can we target mutant or wild type SRSF2? And then, very interesting question that the MDS splicing community together that we're figuring out together as well, why are these splicing factor mutations mutually exclusive? Do cells just not tolerate mutations in two genes, or is it redundant? And um, by crossing several mice, a couple of groups will answer that. We also want to know well, what is the commonality between all splicing factor mutants and MDS, MPD, AML, and maybe can we find um, the common pathway that can be targeted? And since these mutations do not occur alone, but they do segregate with other mutations, what is their relation? So um, just like in, um, in, in the clinical setting, this is teamwork, um, multidisciplinary, and a lot of fun. And this is really how we can advance science. So I have to thank the people in my lab who work wonderfully together. Um, Stephen Liang has done most of this. Ashley Taylor has been valuable help. Kai joined um, recently from Germany and is taking the um, verification of his clip data forward. Jan Bin has been a great help and he's developing mouse models or xenotransplantation models so we can study potential drugs. Kuntevai is actually the person every clinician knows and she's the most charming person in obtaining um, bone marrow samples. Alex is a medical student, um, was in the lab three months and is coming back. Jamie um, is an alumni who was critical in developing the HITS clip um, methodology. And then our collaborators are just awesome. So um, Jorgen Modis, who now moved to Cambridge. Simon Lee helped us considerably with the ITC. Garrett Daubman and Frédéric Allain have um, performed the NMR studies. 
Omar Abdel Bahab at Soul Catering and Rob Bradley are now fantastic collaborators with whom we're taking this work further. Giovanni Stefani Toma Tabaldi are our um, bioinformaticists, so we're shipping this across the Atlantic over the Alps, and um, it's a great collaboration. Menage Palai, um, we are now collaborating with Karl Neugebauer on um, SF3B1, U2A1, and SRSF2, and can't do this without um, funding. Thank you. And if I can entice you to be generous. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really a fascinating talk on um, incorporating a lot of great molecular biology, physical chemistry, adiabatic cells, brought me back to undergraduate days. You know, uh, great stuff. So can you tell us um, in the clinic how important these um, splicing factor variants are? Is that the cause of most MDS? Um, well, they are. They're definitely relevant. Um, so SF3B1, you know, the, the protein in our studies, for example, um, segregates very highly with, ring, with um, refractory with ring sideroblasts, um, but it's also present in CLLL. Um, SRSF2 portends a, um, a poor prognosis in CMML. Um, U2A1 occurs in lung cancer, so they are very important. Okay. Um. So your latter comment or conclusion about co-expression of more than one mutation in a cell not occurring probably frequently, that seems like a testable hypothesis. Is it difficult to assemble more than one um, No, no. So, um, so the the splicing factor mutations um, are not loss of function mutations, so they're gain of function mutations. And one aspect everybody in the field is struggling with is that splicing factor proteins, are ver that the expression levels are very tightly regulated. So we, we use overexpression vectors, but know that um, you know, we have to be careful with interpretation. A lot of the other mutations, RUNX1, ASXL1, TET2, they're loss of function mutations. So we can actually um, combine our, our genes with just SHRNAs. And we're working, and we have several collaborations working on that. Um, at the same time, Omar Abdel Wahab has SSS2 mice. He published on the ASXL1 mice. The TED2 mice are published. And he's, for example, currently generating triple mutant mice. Um, so I think, I think we'll have an answer. Yeah. OK. Any other questions for Dr. Halini? Okay. Thank you.